Let's turn our attention now to another knowledge area, which is project resource management. Within project resource management, we will look at processes that are related to planning with respect to resources and managing those team resources within the executing slash do phases of a project. Project resource management knowledge area includes processes to identify, acquire, and manage the resources that are needed to successfully complete the project. Project resource management is comprised of six processes. Those processes are plan resource management, estimate activity resources, acquire resources, develop the team, manage the team, and control resources. So let's take a moment and pause to be able to see where we are. Uh, I always like to ensure that we understand when talking about a particular knowledge area and the processes that make up that knowledge area, that we can reference and understand in the context of, for example, process groups. So we know that there are 10 knowledge areas and there are five process groups. And they share, or there are processes within knowledge areas that can be mapped to those process groups. The five process groups were initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, controlling, and closing. So when I look at this particular knowledge area, and, and again, this is about resource management. So all of the processes are related to things to do with resources, human resources or otherwise. Just like a risk management knowledge area has to do with risk, a scope management knowledge area has to do with scope related items, schedule management knowledge area to do with time and developing a schedule and managing that schedule. The resource management knowledge area specific to managing resources. So those six processes within the resource management knowledge area map as follows. The first two processes, plan resource management and estimate activity resources, are planning activities and therefore they fall within the realm of the planning process group. The acquisition or acquire resources, and that can be human or otherwise, then develop the team and manage the team. Now, those obviously have to do with the human component of, of resources. So, we, you know, developing the team to make sure that we have a strong uh, performing, high performing team and we manage the individual resources or people within those teams. Those are part of the executing process group. Those are the things that kind of happen when the project enters its doing stage. And then the last one, control resources, makes sense. It's part of the monitoring and controlling process group. Okay, a closer dive, and then we will go into them in even more detail. Plan resource management is about the process of defining how to estimate, how to acquire, manage and utilize physical and team resources. Estimate activity resources is the process of estimating team resources, the type and the quantities of material we may require, the equipment and supplies necessary to perform the work. Acquire resources is the process of going out and obtaining the team members. Now, we may have team members that are internal to the organization, they still have to be brought into the fold of the project team, or we may have external team members, in which case via the procurement processes would be sourced and brought into the team itself. But we also have to obtain materials and equipment. We may have to issue requests for proposals or requests for quotes, set up uh, vendor agreements, licensing agreements. Develop the team is the process of improving the competencies of the team, their knowledge, their skills. 
We also have to ensure that team members interact with each other and they interact well with the environment with a focus on improving project performance. So it's about developing the team within the context of ensuring that project performance is fully optimized. Managing the team is the process of tracking team member performance. We may have particular uh, measures, KPIs, that are team specific performance plans. We have to see how people are uh, f uh, performing against their objectives with respect to the project and their own personal objectives. Provide feedback to team members that may not be performing in accordance with expectations. Resolve any issues and maybe even manage team member changes. Now, those could be that new team members are onboarded. Some team members leave in the middle of a project and have to be backfilled. And so we have to go through a hiring process. Some are not performing well and may no longer be required by or have a place within the project and have to be replaced. And again, we want to make sure that we optimize individual team performance. And finally, controlling the resources. So this is to ensure whether, again, human or otherwise, material or equipment is available to us when it's required or when they are required and that we take corrective actions if necessary. So one example here could be you require certain material to be delivered to a site where work is being performed. Well, we don't want the material to be there too early. Otherwise, it's just waiting or there's risks that it might be stolen. Um, if it gets there too late, it could affect the timing of the work and our schedule. And so it's really about making sure that we're managing these resources accordingly so that they are there. And if they're not, we understand what is the issue and how to rectify that and then correct it. So what's the project manager's role in all of this? Well, you have to see the project manager as both a leader and a manager of the project team. It is their responsibility to ensure that the team is properly formed and constitutes an effective group. There are many things that can influence the team and the team's performance. The environment in which the team performs the work, the geographical locations, how they communicate, stakeholders and across the team, change management, politics, both internal and external, and cultural issues. Think about, as an example, geographical locations. If the teams are distributed in different regions across different time zones, those are certainly things that can affect how the team communicates, how they collaborate, how well they develop cohesion. It also needs to take into consideration tools to allow for that collaboration to happen. We have to understand that communication will take longer. Communication between teams when they're not co-located is going to be a little bit more slower. Decisions are going to be affected. So there's a lot of different things across these elements that do affect performance and the development of the team. And so the project manager really needs to understand the dynamics to be able to properly factor those into their overall management of the team and the resources themselves. As a leader, the PM is responsible for developing the team's skills and the competencies. They're responsible for retaining and improving satisfaction and the motivation of their team. We'll see in subsequent weeks what are some of the motivational concepts and skills, what theories of motivation project managers can apply to ensure that their team members are working within the project optimally because a motivated resource is one that's efficient, is focused, and is aligned with the project outcomes.
The following slide highlights some key emerging trends that project managers need to be aware of. We're not necessarily going to dive into these aspects. These are much more elaborate and require more focused class time, something that is outside of an introductory project management course, but I do want you to be aware of them. So when it comes to managing resources, equipment or otherwise, there are things like mean management, just-in-time manufacturing, Kaizen and theory of constraints. If you have an opportunity, I encourage you to do a little bit of research on these concepts. Another thing that we will explore a little bit more further in a subsequent lecture is the emergence of emotional intelligence. We often talk about a person's IQ, their smarts, but really what makes effective leaders, both project management teams or individuals within the project team, is a focus on and a high emotional intelligence. It helps us focus on self-management and self-awareness, how to manage relationships. And it's been proven that high emotional intelligence teams are more effective teams. Then as we talk about the concept of agile, you'll hear the phrase more and more of self-organizing teams. These are teams that can function in the absence of centralized control, which is exactly what agile practices encourage. You have a scrum master whose role is definitely different than a project manager. They are not there to direct the actions of the team. The team directs their own actions. There's a reliance on less of subject matter experts, but a greater reliance on generalized specialists. Because again, agile environments require the ability to adapt to changing environments. And as we've seen, and that has been you know, particularly accelerated through the pandemic, our virtual teams are distributed teams. Project teams today are more likely to be geographically spread out rather than localized. And that in and of itself brings significant challenges to the project manager and the project team itself. The following slides will dive a little bit more in detail on the inputs and outputs and tools and techniques of the six processes we highlighted. What I won't do is go through uh, listing each and every one of these in detail because really the focus is on the tools, the techniques, the methods and the models and the outcomes. And so I really want to focus on those because those are the things that are not specific to PMBOK 6 or, or 7. These are the things that are um, generally performed and project managers need to be aware of them. So when it comes to the plan resource management process, like any plan process, plan cost management, as we saw, plan risk management, it's all about the output of the, of the resource management plan in this case. And you can see the various inputs that come into play. And then you see some of the tools and techniques, which we will talk about on the next slide. So the techniques that are employed in the development of the resource management plan are expert judgment in negotiating for the best resources, managing talent, determining how we're going to report, how we're going to estimate lead times for resource acquisition, how we identify risks with acquisition and retention. So for example, when developing a resource management plan for a project that spans multiple years, we have to have some planning with respect to retaining the best of our resources, performance, reviews and performance rewards for performance, um, looking at and making sure that salaries are in line with with the marketplace? How do we manage and evolve our talent? Like for example, on the current project that I'm working on our program, we understood that significant skills were required for change management, but many of our resources did not have formal project change management practices or change management practices. And so we brought on Prosci to get ourselves trained in the ADCAR model to support the change management. 
This was built into our plan for resources because we knew that we need to train. And so we highlighted the areas of importance. We also utilized tools like Big Picture. Many individuals have never used Big Picture, let alone JIRA. So we undertook training to be able to ensure that the resources had the right tools and the right knowledge so that they could apply these tools in their project management. Now, some of the ways that data is represented are using things like hierarchical charts, WBS, organizational breakdown structures, resource breakdown structures. And so there are a couple of different ways that we can show how resources are allocated to work. On the right hand side, you will see sort of a chart that looks very, very similar to a work breakdown structure. But what it really is, it's is a resource breakdown structure. And so it breaks sort of the, the hierarchy of resources across the project. And it could be the type of resources, internal, external, or maybe human resources versus material and equipment. And it sort of breaks those down and it shows all of the, all of the um, resourcing that is required for the project. One of the more common tools of representing you know, resources against work is the resource assignment matrix, sometimes also a RACI matrix. And so what you have is you have all of your WBS elements, and then you have your org, you have your resourcing elements, um, and they're represented on a matrix, and you can show which particular resources are responsible or have accountability or must be consulted or must be informed for particular uh, activities on the project itself. Again, have a look at these in closer detail, but it's really the RACI or the RAM that is the one that is the most commonly applied in our project management practices. And by the way, although we haven't looked at this in class, Microsoft Project, a tool like Microsoft Project, even Big Picture, allows these things to kind of be all aggregated within a single tool. So there are ways of building a resource sheet in Microsoft Project and then allocating those resources to the appropriate activities and seeing what that distribution of resources looks like across the work. As I mentioned, the output is the resource management plan and or the team charter or the team norms, uh, something that we created early on in our own class. And what the resource management plan, for example, highlights are key components such as the identification of resources, how we go about acquiring resources, the roles and responsibilities, the organization of those resources, the training that's required, as I mentioned earlier, and how we develop the team, how we're going to measure the team's effectiveness and make sure that the resources are where they need to be at the time they're required, and maybe recognitions plans in order to retain talent. So how do we reward high performers? And what does that look like? The team charter, the team norms are the things that we talked about, and we'll talk a little bit more about teams in a subsequent set of videos. But the team charter, again, outlines the things that you typically see that we work through in our norms, how the team collaborates, what expectations that the team have on each other, what are the values, the shared values, how do they share information, how do they hold themselves accountable and resolve conflict. What approaches and techniques do they apply? And hopefully now that you can see some of these pieces that you've been required to do within the class falling into place. Next process, estimating activity resources. So in this process, exactly as it says, every activity requires resources to be part of the execution of work, who's doing the work, the labor, as well as any material or equipment that's required to do the work. So this is about how much do we need, okay? How many resources and of what skill set? How many widgets? And we're talking about just general material. 
how many meters of cable, how many diggers, what software applications do we need to help manage the work and how much of it, how many licenses. So to do this, right, because it's all about the activities, the really the main input are things like our activity list from our WBS, some of the cost estimates, because the cost estimates were derived based on some sort of understanding of how much material and equipment and resources we require, when those resources are going to be required, the risk associated with them. And again, the tools for estimating activity resources are the same, the same as they are for estimating activity durations and the same for estimating activity costs. So it's expert judgment, bottom-up estimating, analogous estimating, parametric estimating, and so on. The output are the resource requirements and the basis of estimates. Again, anytime we're making estimates, we better document what considerations and what assumptions went into the development of these estimates. So we're going to reach a point in the project in the future where we might be asked to justify or to revise our estimates for whatever, again, durations or cost or the number of resources. And we better be able to remember, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, if you don't document this stuff, you're going to forget. And it's going to be difficult to recreate or try to understand what assumptions you made in the course of developing a particular estimate. If you have to change it, it's going to make it really, really difficult to change and update it. So just a reminder, if you want to see the estimating techniques, then go back and review the estimating techniques deck that we talked about. Now, when it comes to the acquisition or acquire resources, you know, there's this is the, the place in the project where we've planned out how we're going to go about acquiring and managing resources in our resource management plan. We've estimated the number of resources we require. That's part of planning. But now we have to actually put this in practice. Those resources are required to do the work within the project itself. And so we really need to understand our schedule, our resource calendars, our resource requirements, the stakeholder register, and any of the baselines we put together, as well as the plans for resource management, procurement management. Those are all inputs. And then we have to go through the process of how do we acquire? And there's a lot of decision making, multi-criteria decision analysis. We have to incorporate interpersonal and team skills, i.e. negotiating. And then we have to also think about the concept of virtual teams. So what does this mean? But very quick example. You're in a project. We haven't talked about matrix organizations just yet. Um, and there's going to be a video on that particular topic as well. But given the type of resourcing structures or organizational structures are in place, you may have to share resources across multiple projects. Those resources are not managed by you or owned by you, but by other managers in other areas of the business. When you identify certain skill sets that are required for aspects of the project, a data analyst, a business analyst, a designer, a coder, a tester, a person from marketing that can act as a subject matter expert, someone from the engineering department, someone from the procurement department. You have to go out and bring those projects, negotiate those project resources into your project. So you have to understand, first and foremost, where are you going to get those resources? Are they internal? That's part of the decision-making process. Or do you have to go external because you don't have the right skill set or you don't have the right number of resources in the organization to support the project? Okay? Then you might have to internally negotiate or even externally negotiate a rate in the acquisition of those resources. Okay? So there's a lot of sort of decision-making and negotiation that happens in the acquisition of resources. And then the output of this is really just, you know, sort of critical items like, physically assigning the resources, whether they be you know, human resources against specific work and telling them what they need to work on and when they need to work on them, the team assignments, building out resource calendars, that's all part of this process. We're developing the team. Again, this is specific to human resources. Think about 
what it takes to be a team. Think about your own experiences in your projects today, your group projects. You have to become a well-oiled machine. The team has to work well together. They have to have trust in one another. They have to write, have the right skills and knowledge. They have to know what is expected of them. They have to understand how they manage disagreements and differences of opinion. These need to be the focal point of any project manager. And they also have to understand how the physical environment and other what I would call sort of psychological factors can help or hinder the development of the team. So when you're thinking about developing a team, making it one, functional, effective, well-oiled, successful, high-performing, there are things that you need to consider. Co-location, meaning all the resources are in a single location, is obviously going to have benefits. How quickly the team comes together. People that are working together, that are face-to-face -face with each other, that are just a fingertip away, obviously have advantages to teams that are virtual. Virtual teams have other challenges. And there is going to be some challenges in quote unquote, bringing that team together. My current assignment is a virtual team. We've had to learn and adapt on how to be effective, how to be efficient using things like Teams or Zoom calls, how to work on our own, but still be you know, responsible and accountable to our counterparts. And then you have to think about anytime people work together, you know, there's going to be conflict. Human beings need to be motivated. Not everyone comes into the project with the same level of motivation or maintains that level of motivation. Team building is important. How we communicate in the communication technology, as I just alluded to, using things like Teams and Zoom, but also the tools that we use like Jira, which is a collaborative tool versus Microsoft Project, which is difficult to, to work collectively together because you know the plan, unless you're using online version, um, doesn't and is not visible to everyone. Okay. Training, individual team management assessments. And we'll talk about a lot of these things, conflict management, motivation, and team building, and the concepts of leadership and emotional IQ in a subsequent. We'll go a little bit deeper into that. But developing the team is, is really important. If you don't have a team, you can have the best resources in terms of their intelligence, the cream of the crop in the organization. But if people don't come together as a team, you're not going to be successful. And one of the things that I will stress is think about an analogy like your favorite sports team, be it hockey or basketball or football or soccer. There are countless examples of a team that is laden with star talent brought together, but they don't perform well together. They're not a team. And then you have examples of teams that don't have the superstars ragtag bunch of individuals that come together, but they actually come together as a team and they're much more successful. We got to ensure that we drive towards that. So project managers require skills to identify, to build, to maintain, to motivate, lead, and aspire project teams to achieve the highest performance, to help meet project objectives. They have to be able to create an environment that facilitates teamwork motivates the team continuously. There is opportunity for feedback, open dialogue. They recognize and reward good performers. Okay, you've acquired the team. You've gone through and will continuously do actions and activities to develop the team, but you also have to manage the team. That's a continuous process as well. So think about, my again, my analogy. You bring together talent within a sports team. You do all the things, practices and other things to ensure that the team builds that trust in each other. That is, you know, a sum that is more than its parts. 
but you also have to continuously manage the team. Personalities, again, sports analogy, people get frustrated. They don't like their role. They see themselves being utilized in a greater role. They don't like their minutes, their assignment. There's conflict in between team members. So project managers, you have to be able to manage the team. And so you have to be able to assess the team's performance. How is the team doing? How are individuals doing? Right? Are there objectives? Are there measures? Are they doing the things? Do we get feedback from the people that they work with? What are they saying? And we have to be able to utilize that information. And really the key t skills and tools here are the soft skills, the interpersonal and team skills that a project manager and a project team have to build. And again, this involves things like conflict management, emotional intelligence, how to influence and lead the team. Leadership concepts are absolutely important here. And again, we will talk about this in, in more detail. And then you've got things like, well, if team is not performing well, how do we adjust? How do we further enhance the team's performance? Which leads us into the last process, controlling resources. So obviously to know whether the team is performing well or when it comes to the other resources, the equipment, is it there on time? Is it you know, proper? Do we order the right equipment? Is it doing the job that it was intended to do? If it's software to help project performance? So what we're relying on here in terms of tools and techniques is data analysis, right? Gathering performance reviews, feedback from our measures. If something is delayed, why is it being delayed? Doing root cause analysis. So that might be trend analysis. Then you got to problem solve. And if it deals with, you know, human beings, again, interpersonal and team skills are important. Influencing and negotiating here. And if you're interested in further reading and you have access to PEMBOX 6, you can find more about the resource management knowledge area on pages 307 through 358. Thank you.